now recording. Um, I just want to remind everyone, if you haven't seen it, as you know, we, we have canceled the Youth Dressage Festival this year. And, but we are doing a series of little contests all summer, hopefully fun, hopefully something for everybody. And um, if you go to our um, uh, webpage, dressageforkids.org, it's on there. There'll, there's also a link to it from our Facebook page. So I have, um, we're talking today about that dilemma that so many of us have, or uh, at whatever point, do we um, buy, acquire that wonderful schoolmaster that maybe all we can afford, but it's probably older and how many years are we going to have it, but we're going to learn a great deal from it. Or do we take our limited funds and buy a very young horse or a young horse or a very, very green horse and um, hope that it's going to work and um, bring it along to whatever level? I've asked, we have, we have the group of you here. Uh, I've tried to get a little bit of a variety um, for all of you to tell your story. Uh, one story will be longer than the rest, hopefully a little of the most successful one. But we also have some, and I, I ask specifically because there are some that haven't been quite so successful. Um, and uh, um, we'll look at, look at that as well. So, and then if you have any questions, those of you watching, if you look at the bottom of, if you're on a computer, I'm afraid I'm on a computer. I don't know if it's, it's probably different on an iPad or a phone, but uh, there's a chat mode chat uh, icon that you can uh, write any question or comment and I will share them with our group. Uh, don't hesitate to um, at any time to put down your comment um, and I will intersperse it when uh, we can. Mary has put up for everybody over in the chat column the link to our summer contest for anyone that hasn't seen it. So I I promised her she didn't have to stay on the whole time if she didn't want to. So we will start with <laughs> Laura Graves. I think everybody knows her basic story, hopefully. But Laura, if you could tell us a little bit what went into your decision, your family's decision to buy the baby horse, and if there were any bumps along the road, or was it a steady <laughs> incline of success? Yeah, isn't it always? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll try to maybe, I always try to give people in this kind of intimate setting some details that maybe they haven't heard before. Um, but I was just a kid growing up in Vermont. Um, we didn't have any pony club, but we did have 4-H. And we had always had horses. So they weren't easy horses. They weren't trained horses. They weren't dressage horses. Um, but we did have enough um acreage so a good kind of environment for a young horse to grow up in we had other horses for that horse to grow up with we had raised a couple foals already so that wasn't um new to us um and i had at that point i think we had all in about ten thousand dollars to spend on a horse and so we did look for quite a while at everything from, I mean, we certainly couldn't afford a schoolmaster either, but we looked at some older, less trained horses um, or more trained horses. And um, it, it just became like, we knew what we could get for our budget if we shopped a little bit older, wasn't going to be the quality that I was after. Um, I think, you know, looking back, it, it, we knew it was going to be a risk either way. We had had so many horses in and out of our lives, uh, my family's lives, that we, we were kind of prepared for it not to work. And I think uh, even though we had really high expectations, I think, I think you have to be prepared for things to not go according to plan. Um, whether you buy the young horse or whether you buy the schoolmaster. I think, you know, ultimately our decision was based on the fact that we knew we could get more quality um, in a younger horse than we could afford in an older horse. 
Um, but of course, I was also young, and it's it's something a lot of people will tell you not to do. Don't don't buy the young kid a young horse. And I would say one of the, the greatest things we had in our favor um, was that we we did have kind of enough people around us to help us with this young horse. We had trainers and um, cowboys and um, a group of friends who, who could help us along the way. Um, I mean, ultimately he was too much horse for all of them. Uh, every single trainer, he terrified, um, he terrified everybody. So it, um, we really had our hands full. Um, and I mean, it was, even though we were prepared for things to maybe go wrong, we were prepared for things to go wrong. Like he wasn't good enough quality things to go wrong. Like he didn't stay sound, um, things to go wrong. Like we didn't like his personality or, you know, we weren't prepared for, uh, just the amount of horse that we actually ended up with the power and, um, just the athleticism. Uh, and it just really took a whole lot of patience. Um, I don't think there was a time where I ever felt with that horse that we were on a straight path. Um, and, and I think the only way we made it through was that I was constantly searching for help. So whether that was through people I met through shows or through trainers of trainers or whoever I could find who I thought could help me, I would contact and ask for help. And um, it's, you know, that ability that I had as a young kid to reach out I think is ultimately what led me to be so successful is that I knew what I wanted and um, I didn't have anything to back it up. I didn't have any great show results. I didn't have a whole bunch of money to pay a trainer, but I did have this relentless need for knowledge and it really just kept me pushing. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. But since you stopped, somebody's on, I don't know the name, but it just says iPhone that is not muted. Oh, I can mute her. Never mind. I muted her. <laughs> Everybody else, right. quiet in the background. Okay. Go ahead. You gotta, gotta, oh. gotta love, love that feature, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, how old was he when you got him? Um, he was six months old. Okay. And, um, yep, we imported him. It was, that was our first experience with importing horses. Um, and also pretty traumatic for a six month old horse. Um, and I was 16 maybe. Um, so and again, it's a lot of patience. I mean, I think not just when they're difficult, but you have now three years really to kind of wait and i think it tells a lot about a person if if all you're after is the riding you know if that's what's really keeping you interested in the horses i would not recommend a young horse um but if you enjoy doing the groundwork and bonding with the horses in that way i think a young horse i would highly recommend to anyone who has a team around them to help them um, and you know, we, I was at that time probably more confident on the ground with the horses than I actually was in the saddle. So that worked a bit in our favor. Um, and yeah, so let me think here. He was maybe five or six years old and I uh worked with conrad schumacher a bit who i had met through actually london's program um and some clinics that that came to your farm at the time and so i i always enjoyed learning from him and i sought him out and took some training and um, applied for working student positions 
and that's what brought me down here to Florida initially was um, when I moved down here to work for Ann Gribbins, which I did for about three and a half years um, before before I actually three and a half years was probably a year and a half after I realized I should have moved on. <laughs> but I think we're all guilty of, of things like that. Sometimes you get comfortable and um, change is a really scary thing. And, um, but I, I did move on and did what I think a lot of us young professionals do where you kind of try to start your own business. And, uh, you know, if you can even call it a business and um, trying to support myself enough to take, take some more training lessons and that kind of thing. And of course, having to look for a new coach, which is where that ability of mine to reach out for help really came in handy again, because I um, thought of Debbie McDonald and I rode in a clinic with her. I had ridden with her once before. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, the squeaky wheel getting the grease, especially when it comes to something like education. And um, I'm, the, I'm the same now as a trainer, you know, I get so many emails or text messages and, it's not for lack of wanting to reply sometimes, but rather a lack of organization <laughs> and the emails fall to the bottom and whoever that person is, whose email is at the top of my inbox every day, you know, that's the one, that's the name I'm going to remember. That's the email I'm going to respond to. And so, um, again, I just, I said, Oh, and you know, people probably don't know what they're getting into when they share their contact information with me, but I um, would have her email and I had her cell phone number and I would just call and email and um, until she agreed to take me on as a student. And, um, and you know, from there, I think everyone's pretty familiar with the story. Um, and it's well, not, it's not, go ahead. Let me interrupt a moment. Um, again, we do know this. I think most everyone knows the story from there on, but from, I mean, from my point of view, I saw you as a little kid, and then all of a sudden, before international competition, there you were. Was it yeah. a steady rise up the, the, the levels? Because I never saw you. I was never aware of you. Were you being yeah. successful from training level? Did you show him from training level on up? <laughs> so, um... No, I didn't take him to a horse show until, oh, he must have been eight years old. Why not? Um, I was terrified of him. Uh, I was terrified he would buck me off at a horse show. I was terrified he would get loose at a horse show. I was scared. Um, and... I'm extremely competitive. So I, and again, it's not like the budget just grew either. So if I'm going to spend this money and go to a horse show, I better not get bucked off. Um, and, but we, we did take him out. I competed um, second level and third level, maybe two shows. Um, and then started him in some pre-St. George classes. Um, and then when we did get into the CDI ring small tour, and I, I would say that that phase in my life, um, again, I was working for Ann Gribbins during this time. So I was under, under the eye of a very successful um, FEI judge who really kept me on the straight path when it came to competition and hitting those mile markers. Um, but where it was uh, lacking for me was I, okay, so here's the straight path you're on just hitting all your mile markers. And I had these aspirations of being the best in the world, not just at our, you know, USEF shows. Um, so I think we did, it really helped us get organized in that way. Um, but it wasn't until we, I took that giant leap of faith and kind of went out on my own and, um, 
you know, worked with some other trainers that things really started to, to develop for us in that way. And I think everyone kind of thought that, um, you know, where, where did I come from? They mm -hmm. saw, I think in 2014 at the Festival of Champions and everyone kept asking me like, where have you been? And I'm like, I've been right here. Like, I, I've been watching all of you. I've been right next to you guys for the past five years, you know, but no one noticed me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a bit misleading too, is that we just had this one great show and the rest is history. But in reality, it's like I was busting my butt and I don't know how many nights I went to bed thinking, you know, I was going to quit this sport that what I was doing was just ridiculous and was never going to happen. And I mean, I was not just trying to run my training business, but I was also waitressing so that I could have enough money to feed my horse and um, enter him in some shows and ultimately to leave these shows feeling like, like you said, like I came out of nowhere, no one did notice me. Mm -hmm. So you kind of wonder like how crazy you are. Um, during those tough years, did you ever think you were going to sell it? Um, not during that time. I did consider selling him when he was much, much younger. Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, the early years. Yeah. yeah, so maybe when he was about four years old. And he was, even when he wasn't fucking me off, he was really nice to ride. He was a really smart horse, super nice in the mouth really nice off the leg would move sideways I mean I dream of having another horse like this but I don't know if I would be brave enough to ride him anymore but um that part was easy but he wouldn't get on the trailer I couldn't fly spray him um I couldn't tack him up some days like I literally could not get near him with a saddle pad some days and when you're you know 18 years old it's like I just want to put my horse on the trailer, get home and go hang out with my friends. And that life was just not possible with this horse. And so I was working with a trainer in Vermont named uh, Deb Dean Smith. And, uh, you know, we said, we want to sell him. And so you can take the ride on him and you can get him sold and whatever. And um, she called my, my mom a few days later and asked the question you know so laura's been riding this horse and she couldn't even get on him so i mean literally could not get on him could not get him near the mounting block could not get a foot in the stirrup to get on him so um she said if if you guys have any chance of selling him laura's gonna have to put in some more time until he at least let someone else try him <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh by the time we really got that that kind of scary basic stuff out of the way um i believed in my heart that i had the best horse in the country um and that's when i started working for started working for ann um and i moved down here to florida and even though i i had that belief that i had this tremendous horse and that i could get the job done um it wasn't that I ever vocalized it, and certainly no one around me at that point in my life believed it. Uh, Laura, can you hang on a little bit if we talk to some of the others? You're in a hurry to leave. No, okay. that's fine. Um, so let's let's move on just for a moment, and sticking with with getting the the young green horse, Marlena, uh, Marlena Kurz from Texas. Tell us a little bit. Just you, you bought a not so young, but a very green horse and recently have gotten him to Grand Prix. So yeah. uh, just tell a little bit about what, what your journey was like, especially in the beginning. Okay. Um, well, I bought him when he was six and I was 14 and I had only ridden ponies before then. And so moving up to a horse, but moving up to a horse was a little bit of a big deal for me. Um, and he was, he was just a wiggly guy. I mean, he didn't really uh, thought on the bit or do anything on the bit. And a lot of times he would just kind of leave the arena. And so I don't know, I don't really remember 
being afraid of him, really. I just kind of loved him so much because he was so beautiful and because he was a warm blood. And um, so, uh, I mean, we were in Texas for the first, I think, four years that I had him. And um, he, he was still really spooky. He didn't really start to progress until I moved away and became a working student. And um, yeah, I mean, it just, the first few years were really, really slow though, I will say. And I remember this one moment in particular where I was at a horse show and I was just kind of being a brat because I was upset that, you know, he was bucking and spooking and I got, I think like a 57 or something and I was so upset and it was so uncalled for, but um, I got a talking to and then afterwards I, you know, realized how lucky I was to have the horse and that I just need to keep going. And so I kind of just did. And from then on, I just tried to bring him up with the help of some good trainers. I mean, I worked for Felicitas von Neumann Cosell um, in Maryland. And then I clinicked with you a lot to London um, and just kind of took part in some of the opportunities that were kind of thrown my way. And um, so, like I said, but he really didn't start to progress until I was a working student and I was under some, uh, some good trainers that knew about bringing a young horse up and um, getting past their spooky bad behavior. Um, and uh, then I went and I trained with Shelly Francis for two years and um, that's when he really started to progress. And, um, you know, we really solidified his basics then and were able to, um, I think, kind of start to push him and, um, I felt like he was a little bit more um, where he should be in his training at that point. Uh, I always felt like he was behind because when I got him, I mean, he was he was six and he was really green. And the lady that I had bought him from had only trail ridden. So he had no formal dressage training. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really say that it wasn't until I was in a very good, consistent program. Um, that I felt comfortable bringing him up and that I knew that I was, I felt secure in myself that what I was doing was right for him. And, um, Mar so, nice. oh, not Mar uh, how old was he when you were in the WIT program? Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. So he was, he was 12 or 13, I think. And he, he was, was have a flying change at the time. He was yeah. so behind. I just kind of been cruising along. I mean, I, I really didn't have a lot of direction. Like I have right. been saying, I kind of, you know, do a little bit here and there. I was mostly on my own. And so, so yeah, I mean, my thing is, is that for him, it was amazing putting him in a program and that didn't mean that the trainer got on him. I mean, Shelly never rode him. I always, mm -hmm. I, she always had me ride him and yelled at me for it and just <laughs> kind of through. And so I thought that that was, a great way for me to learn. I mean, I feel a lot more comfortable um, teaching just because I had to kind of just kind of ride through it. So, Marlena, if I can interrupt you again, how old was he when you did your first Grand Prix? He was 17. 17. And he's how old now? Uh, he just turned 18. 18. And, and you're ready for him to move on to someone else as the schoolmaster, yeah. correct? He was, he was awesome. I showed him in some of the CDIs in Florida and he was really, he actually, he's a little horse, but he really stood his own against like some of the bigger horses and those classes were pretty big for me. So I was, um, we were getting mid sixties, a little kind of upper sixties at pre St. George, but, um, mm -hmm. and then in those not CDIs, he was, he was getting 70. So yeah. Anyway, it was just cool. I mean, it was really cool to see how he changed once I really put him in a program and right. really, like I said before, that really didn't mean that I had other trainers riding him. It just meant that somebody was, had an eye on me and was, you know, telling me yes, no, you know, do this, do that. And, and I still rode on my own. I mean, there were summers when Shelly was off in Europe and I would just ride on my own. So, I mean, that's part of it too. You have to kind of, um, kind of wade through and figure it out on your own sometime, so. Okay, but, Marlene, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna, let's, let's talk to the others and then I've got some more questions. Um, let's go now to, to the older horse. We'll talk to Rachel. Um, 
where's Rachel? Okay. <laughs> okay, there you are. Um, who, for those of you who don't know, Rachel just had a baby about 10 days ago. So she may look, look a little sleepy, but I think she's terrific. That's not fair. I always tired. I've known Rachel since she was, I don't know, seven. You had your first lesson with me. And Rachel would come with these sort of sometimes rather rank, rather tough ponies that, that I think you all mostly rescued or something. And um, when you uh, had gone to maybe sort of second level with Sonny and then um, Ostrakhan at age, I believe, 18. Yeah. Into your life. And um, what, what, did, what did that bring into your life, riding now a trained schoolmaster? Um, so I think for me, um, I always just was riding kind of backyard ponies and having fun. And my brother and I would ride around Western and just have fun. So for me, I had spent a lot more time, I think, on the ground with my horses, bonding with them. And I'd never really had the experience of getting on and feeling how some of these real movements felt. And it was really eye-opening and changing for me because then I went and rode my green ponies and was able to teach them some of these things that Astrocon taught me. Um, and I was able to take it on further down the road and continue what it felt like on the horse rather than just bonding with them on the ground, I think. It's the biggest thing that Astrakhan did for me. Astrakhan was actually a Arabian mare. Um, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, and uh, I think from looking at it from an instructor's point of view, because I had taught you through all these years, was before I had seen you most of the time going in the ring and showing without you having a sense that it was going to be successful. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of going in and surviving. and and. For me, looking at you for, as the instructor, it was wonderful to see you go in the ring with a sense that I can do really well. Yeah, that was get good swords. Very, that sense. Very yeah, it was a it was it was a big difference, and and I saw such a difference. I'm doing the talking here, um, and the difference of being able to go in the ring with a positive, I can be a superstar. Um, kind of approach as opposed to as yeah. I said. I mean I remember one year showing Sonny at regionals and he took off on me and went into the CDI ring and galloped around and then reared and <laughs> flipped over backwards and there I was like in the seat next to the CDI ring. So having Astrocon I never had to worry or fear going into an arena just to warm up. Yeah. So Fantastic. I think that really brought a whole new level to showing confidence. Super. Let's go to um, uh, Finley. Finley, uh, where's Finley? Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Finley's there with her mom, Patty. Um, and if I'm, how old are you? How old were you, Finley, when you got your pony? Eight. 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 And how old was the pony when you got him? Twenty. Twenty. So <laughs> you all and and Patty, you two. Um, what in the world made you buy a 20 year old pony and was it a good idea? Um, I had, I have, I had some really bad ponies and we were looking for a horse that I could be more confident on and trust and work on my riding and make it better without having the worry that I was going to get bucked off. Mm -hmm. And that pony has given you that confidence. Has that pony given you any more than confidence? Have you been able to show him? Is it positive? Yeah. Tell us a little bit. Um, yeah, so her eight-year-old year, she showed him and she took him to YDF that year and she won her division that year. And I can just remember having gone through those three bad ponies who I couldn't trust her with anywhere, you know, being on that, that big, the big, area at hits and warming her up near the stone wall and I knew her ring was way over there and like we've got this and off she goes you know trotting across that big area and I um that the solidification I think that we had well certainly done the right thing um because that year really changed I think her as a rider in terms of and how old is he now he's 24, 24 and are you still riding him 
Yeah, I'm riding around. We have an outdoor arena, so I've been riding around at home. Some balls. Can you get a little closer? Is it a phone? We can't quite hear you. Yep. Yeah. Um, we've been working on some, well, we have an outdoor arena, so we've been just riding bareback, working on my seat and trying some vaulting. Uh huh. And will you be showing him this year? Um, I don't think so. I made you like maybe it, it depends if they, because there's not a lot of shows. There's okay. some shows, there's a lot of shows that have been canceled. So let me, let me ask you this if you were able to show this year, what level would you be showing in? He's sort of retired ish. He's kind of like a I would do, max first level pony, I think. Yeah. Um, so I would do first level. And if you he doesn't first, have a the first level you've done, has it been successful? Yeah. With your 22, 23 year old pony? So yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on to Elsie. And mm -hmm. Elsie Reford from, from Canada has both situations. And Elsie, if you could tell us first a little bit about the journey you've had buying a young horse and then yeah. what the older horse coming into your life has done for you. For sure. Um, so in my situation, actually, uh, my mom does a little bit of breeding. So my mare was born on my farm um, when I was 11. And at that point in my riding, I had just had a been growing up doing ponies and uh, riding ponies at like local fairs and stuff, not really focused in dressage. Um, I did a bit of jumping and just enjoyed being with the horses. And then uh, when I was 10, uh, my parents uh, were generous enough to make the investment to get an FEI pony who was trained uh, through FEI ponies with like a, a green flying chain. Um, so that was really my first introduction to dressage. And so by the time uh, my mare was born, I was thinking like, oh, I really like this sport and I want to go to the Olympics and <laughs> having the stars in my eyes. So uh, my mare was born and she's a beautiful dark bay, uh, super flashy, four white talk, like looks the show ring part, everything like that. So I remember telling my mom a few days after she was born, like, this is going to be my next course, like, just watch us go. And she was like, okay, like, haha, just kind of brushed me off. And, and uh, so as she was growing up, I was still riding the ponies and everything. And um, then when it came time to start training her, I was really dead set on being super involved with the training. I wanted to do everything myself. I, in retrospect, had very little clue uh, how to train a horse. Um, I was still really learning the basics of dressage and how to keep a contact and all those things with my FEI pony. Um, so this was an interesting project. Uh, and I had some very good help um, getting her started and doing all the backing was super successful. And I've always been the type of person who uh, has had good balance and is just good at sticking on. My pony was extremely spooky. Um, so I was good at going with the motion and that's kind of what made me think, okay, I have a chance of, of starting this young horse because in the beginning, it's all very basic. And then that we started her a bit late and then uh, the summer she turned, Five was when I started taking her out to clinics and I think that's probably the first time I met you Lendon uh, in Bedford um, so anyways I got to do the whip program with her when she was five and that was really uh, where I learned how uh, difficult um, the journey was going to be I think with her, um, she was incredibly difficult to handle on the ground. Uh, she's very, very pushy, um, likes to have her own way. And I was just like, okay, uh, 
well, I'm just going to ride you and really did not have much of a clue as to how to get that done. And uh, we did have some success by the end of our term in Florida um, and got, we got to show it global, which is definitely a highlight for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as she developed uh, over the years, it was always a case of uh, just unwilling, um, very tricky behavior under saddle and also on the ground. Uh, I would go out in the field and spend hours crying and trying to catch her and just, there was no chance. <laughs> I would have to go back into the barn when the sun would set and just try again the next day. Um, yeah, so where I think we could have really uh, changed paths is if we had some more consistent help in developing her after she was backed. Um, I think just listening to what Laura had to say and uh, the help and team that she said she had surrounding Verdatis, um would have been incredible and I think probably changed the game if I had had that with my mare. Um, and of course I did have good instruction throughout our journey like with the WIP program and clinics I would take advantage of those as, as much as possible but um, yeah, she is really a horse that needs to have uh, a very, a rider with a very clear image in her mind. And I think a lot of the times I just didn't have a super clear image of what I was even looking for in her. Um, and Elsa, let, uh, me let me interrupt. Uh, yeah. how, old, how old is she now? So she just turned 10, which is really exciting. I feel like we're turning over a new leaf. Um, <laughs> and and at, at what level approximately is she? So we actually had a really successful season in 2018. Um, we got some grant money to go out and do a full on show season. So I took her out uh, to show definitely every month. I think we maybe did five in the circuit. At what and, level? Uh, second level okay and we ended up being our uh the association like our local association like second level champion that year and how about last awesome. year how about last, last year, year <laughs> things really hit the skids um so that was 2019 so following our show season in 2018 um we had a clinic that was really tough uh at the end of the fall and that I think really put a strain on her physically and also mentally. And then we were prepping to go down to Florida again um, for wit again. And her behavior, she was hard to handle. She, that's when she started um, becoming really aggressive. Uh, she would kick out um, just when I would put the halter on, biting, ears pinned back. Um, Elsie, I'm gonna interrupt you again so we can yeah. keep moving. So if I can tell, tell me if I'm saying this correctly, you, you okay. have um, behavioral and not lameness, but there's, there's some discomfort in her that you really haven't been yeah. Is that exactly? Okay? Yeah. So, uh, I even think though, even though you, you raised her, she's been beautifully handled everything. Yeah. Like, there are still, some physical, something. Exactly. Not. There's still a mystery going on. So yep. every day is a new off today at the vet. <laughs> adventure. Yeah. So yeah. we're getting that behavior report soon. And I'm actually uh, recently in quarantine, I've been really getting into uh, positive reinforcement training. And I think that could really be beneficial for her. So I've enrolled in this new online academy that's going to teach me everything I need to know, <laughs> hopefully <laughs> change our lives. So tell us about then having a, a schoolmaster come into your life. That was what, last year? Yeah, so that was uh, all thanks to that. the horse donation program in London and us having a conversation where Lennon's like, is it possible for you to get a new horse? Because I don't know where you're going with uh, your mare. So yeah, so uh, my new guy, I got him last July and he is just a saint, 15-year-old uh, um Westphalian gelding and uh, I can just get on him and try things out and he's incredibly forgiving so that's been really 
confidence boosting for me and has actually put the fun back into riding because at a certain point with my mare, it was just like emotional punishment. (laughs) Just uh, every day was a chore and trying to figure out what I could do to help her and getting very little positive feedback from that uh, in terms of how her behavior would change. Um, So yeah, he is fantastic. And I think uh, if I had to do it over again, I would definitely choose to do a schoolmaster or choose to get more foundation, more miles on me as a rider before venturing off and, and getting a young horse. But I also think that the experience with the young horse taught me things just as a person and as a horse woman that I might not have if I had had an easier ride. It's just a different experience. So I wouldn't trade it away. Okay. Either. Let, let me, let me go back a moment um, to a couple of you, Laura and, and Marlena bringing up the young horse even though you, you've gotten it to both of you, your horses to Grand Prix, because you had the young horse and, and the, in both cases they weren't easy, you weren't able to do NAYC. Laura, do you feel you missed out anything? Um, definitely, definitely not. <laughs> um, I think maybe the one thing um, would be a little bit, I didn't meet a lot of other people my age um, looking towards the same thing. So until until 2014, I never really had a group of peers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think that camaraderie is something that is great for the youth. Um, however, I also know that at that age, not everyone is so supportive and friendly. Um, so sometimes maybe it's not always a healthy thing and maybe, maybe it was a good thing that I didn't have that experience, but as a professional, um, looking back, I don't think I feel that I missed out, um, Mm -hmm. on, on it from a competition or an educational perspective, um, Uh, But I was also raised in a family that was a team. So I had that experience, not through horses, but through my family. So I think there are things that it probably offers to to kids who don't have that maybe team atmosphere in their life in a different way, whether it be through a different sport or through your family. So, um, but no, I don't. Of course, if I hadn't had the success I've had, maybe I'd look back and wish I had done Young Riders. So it's easy to say that now. Um, but I also think, uh, was it Elsie who was just talking? Yes. And she's saying how having the schoolmaster first might have been, you know, great miles and education. And I totally believe that. But I also think that you, you maybe wouldn't have appreciated him the way that you do now if you didn't have this really difficult mare. So yeah, that's a good point. I've had this really difficult young horse who now is just like my best friend and the easiest horse I ride every day. But I get these other young horses who are scared of nothing and they just four years old do walk trot canner. They do counter canner. They, I can tack them up every day. They cross tie. It's like all these amazing things that make me appreciate um, these other horses I have. And I think, it's also difficult when you only have one horse and it's a very difficult one. I think it says a lot about your character that you keep getting up every day and you call it like emotional torture, <laughs> but it's, it's a, a, something inside of a person that says, okay, this isn't great, but I'm going to have to keep trying until it gets great. Yeah, um, for sure. But it never but crossed when, my mind that it wouldn't like that I would give up, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that's something you can't teach someone, but it's also difficult when all you have is one horse. So I remember being in that situation and now it's much, much easier for me as a professional having a whole bunch of horses and maybe one horse today is horrible. Uh, but maybe six of them are really good. So it's a little bit easier to, to not feel like you're torturing yourself 
Whereas when you have that one horse, it's like all your energy, all your eggs are in that basket. And when they're terrible, like your whole day is terrible. So um, I do think that self-torture builds character. <laughs> uh, Marlena, you didn't do North Americans, did you? Marlena? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't. Do you feel, I mean, you're, you're uh, younger than, than uh, Laura, but do you feel that you missed out? Do you have regrets because you were struggling along with this? I thought you were polite about your horse. I thought he was quite extremely difficult when I, when I knew him. <laughs> um, he, he wasn't saying, I can't wait to be a Grand Prix horse, that's for sure. Um, do you feel like you missed out? Uh, I did at the time. Definitely threw a little party when I was 14, 15. But now I really, I don't mind. But I mean, I had some really amazing experiences, like WIT being one of them, um, that program. And so I don't think it really, I mean, to me, I don't look back and say, man, I, I really wish I could have competed or um, if I had really. If I depress the truth on my horse without making it really, you know, physically able to do it and mentally able to do it, then I would have had a terrible experience. So that's the main reason, just that, you know, okay, yeah, I probably could have tried to put the flying change on him, even though he hated it. But I don't think I would have had you know, the Grand Prix horse in the end because I was trying to push for the juniors. That's like the fourth with the young Robert George test. So so just for his sake, I, I'm okay with it. And, you know, there will always be shows. I mean, there'll be CDIs and those are in my mind, those are extremely competitive too. So it's okay. I mean, I'm, I don't regret it at all. I, I think there's such a pressure on young people that, you know, if we don't do NAYC, we're nobody. And uh, uh, you two certainly have proven that's not the case. Um, Rachel, I have a question for you. Um, uh, you rode these orangutan ponies uh, a lot. Were you ever afraid? No, but looking back, I really should have been. <laughs> I should have been terrified. I mean, I remember riding one of the ponies who ended up being my FBI pony, and she was four years old at the time, and she had taken off through the woods, and I was with my brother, and I got my arm hung up in the tree and broke my arm. And I still rode her like every day after I loved her. She's my favorite pony. <laughs> but uh, no, I wasn't. I should have been terrified. Okay, good. Uh, Laura, you mentioned that, you know, there you were, you did have some fear with, with your horse. How did you overcome that? That was one of our questions from a, one of our um, I was very lucky in the way that I was scared of him because he was so strong that when he did decide to uh, buck or he, ne he never bolted, the horse has zero fight in him. Um, but he is very, very sensitive that when you would get bucked off, uh, it, all it took was one buck and you were on the ground. So there was zero chance of sticking it. Um, but the thing that got me over my fear, I actually hated to show before I had this horse um, because I had horses who didn't like to go in the show ring. They would be naughtier at the shows than they would be at home. And they were lovely at home. We had mostly free horses. Um, and so I was lucky I had confidence in that way. But in the show ring, I did not. I mean, I would get sick. I would physically get sick at shows because I was so nervous. Um, and the first show that we took Diddy to, being so nervous, and I got sick, just like clockwork, and I threw up in the bathroom. Okay, now I'm ready to get on. And I, I rem he was better. He had been terrible at the farm all week leading up to the show. And he just loved to horse show. He liked being the only horse. He liked all of the attention. He had a little bit of nerves leaving the warm up and being alone in the ring, but he wasn't uh, naughty. He was actually fun to show. And so I really credit him with giving me that, that confidence. Um, and as far as getting over the fear of riding him, it was more of just uh, really trusting, trusting him and respecting him. So when he said, I'm afraid, or when he said, that's too much, we just listened and, and backed off and mostly for our own safety. <laughs> but uh, 
it was the you know the fairest thing to do for him as well and of course it, it worked out as far as our relationship this isn't the subject of our of our program here but i'm dying to know what diddy's doing now because you have retired him correct technically um he's been very very naughty he at first we were keeping him really fit because the plan um my phone only has 15 percent, so i hope i don't lose you okay. guys but the plan was to take him to vegas and do this big special right. retirement ceremony and um just devastated that all that got canceled because there just won't be another opportunity like that um but we were keeping him really fit so that he looked good for vegas and um then when that was all canceled, I really tried to let him down. And we had a couple days like hacking him on the back of the farm where I actually had to bail off and like hand walk him back to the barn and lunge him. Uh, so he was working still part time and then he's, he's slowly been behaving himself. And I had him then out in the field with my other retired horse. You might remember a little quarter horse named Sunny. Oh my, yes. Yeah. And um, so we put them out together and he got really frisky the other day and like reared up and came down and gave poor little Sonny like 12 stitches in his, oh. yeah. So he is back in work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's enjoying retired life. He's certainly very happy, very relaxed, very fat. Um, but, but he likes the attention and he gets tacked up probably three days a week. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, I wouldn't think he's a horse that you can just say, you're done. No, and I mean, luckily my horses always go to turnout. Um, I'm kind of that unusual, you know, high performance barn where they do go out at least four hours a day. Um, so it's a good thing that he's used to that part. But as far as the attention goes, and I do think it's a good thing to keep, keep the older horses a little bit fit. Not that we drill him with dressage movements, but that we, we move him around and um, keep some muscle on him. And um, yeah, I think it actually helps them stay younger. Absolutely, yes. Um, this is a big subject, but we do have uh, someone who has asked, with your experiences in mind, what would you look for today if you were buying a young horse without making it a whole lecture? <laughs> hmm. You know, you have, they have to, you have to love them. Like I watch probably a hundred sale videos a week, whether it's for myself or clients. And if I don't want to watch that video from start to finish, don't buy it. Um, and then break it down but there has to be something in your heart that's drawn to a horse. Um, because no matter if they're how talented they are or how not talented they are, if you don't love them, it's never gonna work. Um, and a young horse, you know, I do learning now, I look back and the, the breeding, the trainability is the biggest thing that I would look for. So Diddy had a fantastic mind. He always, always, always wanted to do a job and he wanted to do it for me. And um, I have some other horses in my program who, you know, the more you learn, the more people say, ah, you know, that's a typical Bordeaux or, or whatever. And um, I'm not really into that part of sport horses, but um, if they're too young to ride, I think you have to trust people who maybe have some experience with those bloodlines. And you have to look at that horse and say, I love him or her. And then I break down three really clear gates. You got to have a good walk. You got to have a good canter and a trot that you can work with. Um, and of course, for me, the trot that you can work with comes from the brain. So um, yeah, the three good gates and something that you just can't stop watching on repeat. Uh, something that Laura said, Rachel, I want to ask you, um, when Mouse came into your life, um, did you fall in love with him right away? I did when I first saw him. I'm sorry? <laughs> he was love at first sight. <laughs> he, I actually did not like Pierre's before I went to try him and rode him. I was very skeptical of the breed and I'd only seen a couple. And then I remember getting there and walking into the barn and him sticking his nose out and just being, that's my horse. I love that horse. And then somehow I got lucky enough that it all came together, but it was not easy. 
And he would, I mean, you talk about having some frustrations there. Again, I, I know this situation well. And uh, he did take you to the North Americans and the national championships. And you did do a one under 25 Grand Prix, didn't you? Yeah, we went to festival in the oh, that's right. okay. Yeah. Um, but a very difficult horse. But again, a tremendous <laughs> partnership. Uh, between right. I think it was his heart and his brain. Like he wanted to work for me. Mm -hmm. And that was just an amazing partnership. It's just because he always tried his best for me. And that was just to put my two cents in, that was a little bit of a funny situation because here was a horse. He wasn't an old horse, but he was what, medium age? I don't remember. Uh, he was eight when I, or okay. nine, nine when I started riding him. Somewhat unrideable and had been a disaster um, with other riders. And Rachel was pretty young and it was just that, you know, she fell in love with him and I think he fell in love with her. He, he had had professionals riding him that he, I mean, he was a terrible spook. He had no focus. He was, he was not fun. Um, <laughs> but you just had that partnership and that, you know, two hearts meet. Um, yeah. I'm just checking. We don't have any other questions from our peanut gallery here. Um, we're almost, uh, we're sort of running out of time. Um, Laura, I know, if, if, are you still here before your phone runs out? Uh, do you yeah. have any any I, I plugged it in. Oh, okay. Any little fi final words for everybody? Oh, well, that's a lot of pressure. Um, no, you don't have to say anything. Okay, <laughs> words of wisdom. Um, no, but really, I, I, I do think at the end of the day, you when it comes to making the right choice, there's there's risk on, on both sides. Um, and even if you get this great schoolmaster, there's a risk uh that you know you don't have that much time but there's that same risk with the young horses you know i for example after diddy i did buy two more foals um and one of them is six now the other one had to be euthanized as a yearling so there's risk any which way you look at it and i think um educating yourself surrounding yourself with people who can educate you and help you seek out more education and selecting the very best quality horse that you can afford um i do think you know assessing the goals of whether it's your child who's riding or yourself who's purchasing this horse if your goals are are just to gain confidence if you're not confident then, then buy the best horse you can afford for that. Mm -hmm. um, and and being, being honest with what your goals are. Um, and, and don't feel pressured to buy in a certain period of time. You know, everyone wants to sell you a horse. And they'll tell you, this is the right horse for you. This is the right horse for you. And a big part of my job with my students is going with them when we're shopping and saying, no, this is not the right horse for you because it's, it's easy to sell something to someone who's excited. Um, and trust, trust your gut and yeah, surround yourself with people who are knowledgeable. Fantastic, thank you. Any of our other people here? Um, actually, I have one question if she's still on. Oh, Brittany, are you on? Brittany Stanley, yes, who sells horses to people. Do you have any from Europe? Do you have any little piece of advice, Britt? Where's Brittany? Says she's on. Maybe not. She's hiding. Um, ah, now Brittany, you got me? Okay. Just ah. we don't have much time, Brittany. Do you have, as, as someone who suckers these people into buying horses? <laughs> oh, I would. Don't call it that. Make sure. Like Laura said, you have a good community behind you because any horse can be difficult, but especially if you're going to go the young horse route, you need people in your corner that when you have a problem, you have someone to take the horse to nearly immediately. Um, I think young horses are fantastic. As London knows, I always buy two-year-olds and do it myself, but it's not for everyone. So make sure you have good help of all kinds around you if you're going to go the young horse route. And your first young horse wasn't so easy. You bucked me off very badly and very embarrassingly. <laughs> oh, 
right in front of me. Uh, yeah, right. and Mika, and a, yep, yep, a few other people. Okay. But it was worth it. So. Okay, thanks, yeah. Brooke. Um, Marlena, any parting words? You don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, I'm good. Okay, Rachel? I'm good. Okay. Um, Elsie? Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, just be willing to look out for your horse, obviously, and try to take your expectations or your pressure off and see where it goes and just be willing to try new things to see what helps. Okay, great. Uh, well, I thank you all. We were exactly an hour. Good job, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, sharing your experiences and best of luck to everybody. Thank you, London. Okay, bye. Thanks, bye guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.